Hello, my name is Rob Corliss, and I am giving the talk Compact Finite Differences in Cubic Splines at the 8th Seminar on Numerical Analysis and its Applications, uh, hosted by the University of Kurdistan in Sanandaj. Um, without further ado, I will begin my discussion. This video recording is made as a backup, but I'll put it on YouTube. So as an abstract to the talk, uh, I'm talking about something that's really very old. Fitting a smooth curve to discrete data is one of the oldest computational problems. It's been solved very decisively in several ways so that there really isn't any need to solve it again. There's always something new to say, but the question is how important it is. Uh, in my uh, uh, paper, which is on the archive, I explain using contour integrals and residues, a connection between cubic splines, one of these methods for fitting a curve to data, to a popular compact finite difference formula. So the connection is that on a uniform mesh, the simplest Pade scheme for generating fourth order compact finite differences gives exactly the derivatives at the interior nodes that you need to gen to guarantee twice continuous differentiability for cubic splines. In doing so, I managed to make a uh, tiny, I think, improvement to the uh, construction of these uh, degree three interpolants. So in particular, the treatment at the edges has always been a bit ad hoc in, in my view. Uh, I introduce a new method, which I'll call the resulting interpolant a compact cubic spline. And it's new, but not completely new. In 1972, a paper by Swartz and Varga uh, introduced something similar, which used a, a third order accurate derivative at the edges. Uh, this, you'll see here that the approach that I have gives fourth order accurate uh, derivatives at the edges. But the main theoretical contribution of the work is to prove that the uh, matrix for computing compact finite differences with these edge conditions is actually totally non-negative, and that allows very stable numerical solution of the equations. Okay, I have given two versions of this talk before, once at the University of Manchester and once at the University of Alcala. Uh, in the first audience, there were many numerical linear algebraists. And in the second audience, there were computer algebraists and experts in totally non-negative matrices. Maybe today, there will be experts in compact finite differences in, in the audience. Compact finite differences are an extremely useful technique, and so I would not be surprised. However, all of these subjects are quite old, and it is at, actually a bit surprising that there's anything new to say, even if it is quite minor. So maybe the most important thing that you might do from this talk, you might get from this talk, is to pick up something of those other classical subjects. It's not always the case that somebody who knows something about one of these things knows something about the other. So I will give pointers to the literature. So cubic splines, the most popular choice continues to be a piecewise cubic approximating function. And just to give a little flavor of uh, doing something on the on the whiteboard, I uh, decided to make my notation by a little whiteboard uh, that I have in my home office here, and I present it here to give you the notation. I'm going to be considering the problem uh, given functional data on the mesh. So at, at uh, tau zero, we're given y zero, at tau one, we're given y one, and so on. And so those are all the blue dots that we're given. And the computational problem that we're going to be asked us to solve is, and the first uh, place, is to find a way to give a nice smooth fit to all that data. And the way we're going to do that was comp is with uh, cubic splines. Standard, traditional kind of thing. And what in order to do that, you have to construct the derivatives at each of the nodes. You typically by the, the equations in uh, determining splines, they 
construct all those red slopes on the interior nodes, uh, D1, D2, D3, all the way up to Dn minus 1. The slopes at the edges are different. There's something special about them. Uh, they're, we can, in fact, choose them freely in the spline paradigm, and this is both good and bad. Anyway, once the di are known, once you know all the, not only the function value, but also the slope at each of those points, over that subinterval, you can now use those four pieces of information to construct a cubic polynomial that's valid over that subinterval. A very simple, very classical problem. This is done, for example, in uh, Python, in SciPy, uh, with the SciPy interpolate package. So if we have some data, so for example, uh, if you take the the values of the sine function at equally spaced points on interval from zero to pi over two, uh, these were the points that were known to Mudpa. And if we construct the uh, cubic spline interpolant with the built-in routines and then evaluate that spline over all of the points from zero to pi over two and compare that with the true values. So we subtract in the, in the first plot, the lower looking plot, that's the error between the, the cubic interpolant and the sine function. And the slightly larger plot is the error between the derivative of the spline and the true derivative. One of the things that makes splines very useful is that they don't just provide good approximations for the function values, but they provide good approximations for the derivatives as well. You can see that it's from this uh, graph that the derivatives are not as good as the function values are. In fact, they typically lose an order of accuracy when you differentiate, but it's not bad. I mentioned Mudpa. Mudpa was a <clears throat> 12th century, <clears throat> pardon me, a 12th century uh, uh, mathematician and astronomer, uh, maybe a little bit earlier than the, the more famous uh, Persian astronomer and mathematician uh, Nasser uh, al-Din al-Tusi, uh, but uh, of similar mathematical interests. So Mudpa, that's a, just a link to his Wikipedia page, which you can uh, follow on your own. Uh, he did some very interesting things with uh, essentially what we know now as Taylor series approximations to functions and was able to get eight place accuracy for the trigonometric functions. So here is uh, the errors in cubic spline interpolation of the Runge function. So this is a function which is very smooth on the interval from minus one to one, just comes up and comes down. It's just absolutely a beautiful function. You'd think interpolating that on equally spaced points would, would be very easy, and it is for splines. For splines, we get very nice uh, uh, convergence, but if we use equally spaced points and try to fit a global polynomial, we run into real trouble. And that's because there are complex singularities at uh, plus or minus one fifth i that are quite near to the interval of uh, approximation. And they give problems for equally spaced points interpolation for global polynomials. But as you can see here, the, we get fourth order convergence to the function and third order convergence to the uh, uh, value of the derivative. Excellent. Okay, well, how does it work? How does a cubic spline work? The theory of splines is classical. So here's the first of the uh, introductions to the literature. If if you've never seen a cubic spline before or a spline in general, the I think that the place to start is Carl de Boer's uh, A Practical Guide to Splines. That is a, a wonderful textbook. And in spite of being written uh, 40 years ago or more, it is still of a serious value. As I mentioned early on, uh, the usual presentation of computing as a cubic spline boils down to identifying the derivatives at the interior nodes. Once you've identified good values of the interior nodes, then uh, you're done. Now the way to do that for a cubic spline is you insist that those derivatives be chosen so you get uh, twice continuous differentiability at 
at either end. So the, the interpolants come in and they match, so C0. The slopes are the same, so it's C1, but the, the second derivative is the same. So it's actually uh, twice continuously differentiable at the, at the nodes. And that is a useful property. That's the definition of a spline. There are other alternatives. The piecewise qubit convert uh, P chip, it's called in MATLAB, it provides something that is better at shape, uh, preserving the shapes. But uh, I'm going to present an, yet another alternative here with what I want to call the compact cubic spline. So in the equally spaced case, uh, these equations for the unknown derivatives for cubic splines boil down to this set of equations here. Uh, if you know the function values, you take the differences and essentially you get a finite difference of the a centered finite difference of, of the function values, yi plus one minus yi minus one divided by two h multiplied by six. So the same as, as three over h. So on the right-hand side of that equation, you have an approximation for the derivative. On the left-hand side of the equation, you have an average of the slopes at i minus one i and i plus one. So that gives you one equation to determine the slopes. Well, you have at every single one of the nodes, you have uh, one of those equations. So we have n minus one equations and n plus one unknowns. The data yi is presumed known and we want to use these equations to uh, compute the di. And we go ahead and do that, try diagonal equations, particularly diagonally dominant systems like this, a symmetric uh, positive definite. Tri uh, tridiagonal system is uh, very numerically stable to solve, and away you go. But it leaves open what to do at the edges. We have this freedom of choosing the derivatives at the edges, just extra things. So what seems to be most common is you choose those slopes at the edges to ensure three times continuous differentiability at the first interior node on the one side and three times continuous differentiability at the, at the uh, node at the other end. And that's the default and it, people seem to be reasonably happy with it. It's a bit unnatural, but okay. Um, Swartz and Varga instead said, well, let's use a third order accurate explicit finite difference and use uh, f of zero, f of h, f of 2h, f of 3h, so we'd use y0, y1, y2, and y3, and we'll use that to estimate the derivative at d0, and this with uh, order h cubed error. It did not catch on, and I don't know why. Uh, I'm going to advocate something similar, but this is a third order formula, and I'm going to ask for a fourth order formula, but that still fits in with the general scheme of, of solving the equations. All right, compact finite differences. Here we have something that's enormously practical. We've, uh, well, not that <laughs> spines are, of course, enormously practical as well, but compact finite differences are in active use for solving problems in math finance and uh, uh, problems in simulation of uh, electrical stimulation of the heart or the muscular activity in the heart. There are lots and lots of applications of compact finite differences because they're flexible and they provide near, spectra, near spectral accuracy. And this paper by uh, Lille is extremely highly cited and well worth reading. So that's from 1992, just a little while ago. Again, this is one of the highlights of this talk. If you uh, take away nothing from this talk except for a few references, here's one of the references that you should take away. Uh, the reasoning behind uh, explicit uh, or the compact finite differences is that exp explicit finite difference formulas can be a bit wasteful. So if you just take a, a centered difference, you get an order h squared error in there. Well, if you look at the Pade scheme, which I've written here in this D notation, the derivative of f at minus h plus four times the derivative of f at zero plus the derivative of, of f at plus h minus three over h, f of h minus f of minus h is actually order h to the fourth. So we have a fourth order accurate equation. 
And it also happens to be exactly the same as the equations defining the derivatives for a cubic spline. So that's a surprise. It was a surprise to me anyway. And one of the questions that I set out to answer was, can we explain this coincidence? Because we're solving a different problem. Here we're computing derivatives. We're not trying to make uh, an interpolant have second order continuity at at the, at the node. That, that's not what we're doing. We're actually trying to compute accurate derivatives. Why should those two problems have the same answer? It's a, this process of computing derivatives is also of interest on a mesh where the the intervals are not the same. You might have, you know, one big one, one moderately tiny, tiny one, one much smaller one. Okay, have, as these things go. So, if can we do that on variable meshes? And the answer is yes. Uh, the uh, interior node equations are the same kind. We have a weighted average of the slopes is equal to a weighted average of the fun function values. Essentially, we're saying on the left, it's going to be some sort of finite difference approximation to the derivatives. And then we have a weighted average to the derivatives on the left-hand side, which will improve the error. So where did these formulas come from? These were derived using contour integral methods, which I'm going to explain. This particular formula is exact for polynomials of degree four or less. So if the value, the function values yk, yk minus one, etc., are given by a polynomial of degree four or less, this will give you the exact derivatives. The contour integral trick. Here is another reference. This is a wonderful paper by John Butcher. So the 1967, a multi-step generalization of runge kutta methods with four or five stages. So this is maybe an important paper in the history of uh, solving differential equations numerically as well. So I think it's worth reading even just for that. But it introduces a very nice method for constructing interpolants. It's very likely that Hermit knew this as well. So this trick is not uh, necessarily due to John Butcher, but uh, that's a good paper to read it in nonetheless, is it direct, direct use in numerical analysis. So it's based on the standard trick. The standard trick is that if you integrate a rational function around a large enough contour, uh, and the rational function has a polynomial of degree on top that, that is no more than two less than the degree on the on the bottom, the standard argument says that the integral is sort of like one over r, and, and, and r goes to infinity. You you must have uh, the the integral actually being zero because that's the only thing that can the only constant that can be order one over r as r goes to infinity. That's a standard argument in complex analysis, and it gives, says, okay, well, big deal. We have the integral of a rational function is equal to zero. Now we make a special, special construction for the denominator. I'm going to say z minus tau zero squared, z minus tau one squared, all the way up to z minus tau n squared on the bottom. So we're going to have degree 2n plus 1 on the uh, uh, on the bottom, and so that means the degree of p can be at most 2n plus 1 minus 2. Okay, what is that going to get us? Well, if we expand the 1 over the node polynomial, the 1 over z minus tau 0 squared, z minus tau 1 squared, etc., in partial fractions, and use the Cauchy integral formula, then we get a relationship between those contour integrals and the values of the polynomial and its derivatives, it's actually the Taylor coefficients at each of those nodes. So that integral being zero gives us, in, in some sense, a relationship between the values of the function and the derivatives at all of those points. Okay, this is interesting, but it's still not clear where I'm going with this. Uh, in our case, we use a really, really simple thing. We say we want p of z on the top to be of degree at most four. And on the bottom, we're only going to have three nodes. We're going to have uh, tau zero, tau one, and tau two. 
and we're going to get a, a formula valid for polynomials p of z at, of degree at most uh, 2n, which is 4. So we expand everything in sight in partial fractions. And uh, those of you who are uh, have recently taught partial fractions to, to your students will say, oh yeah, that, that looks right. I've got all the right kinds of things. It's hard to see the z minus tau zero in, in the, so et cetera. We have, I don't think my cursor, oh, it does, my cursor does work here. So here we have z minus tau zero squared. Here we have z minus tau one squared. We have z minus tau two squared. And on here, we just got a z minus tau two, z minus tau one, z minus tau zero. And so that's the complete partial fraction decomposition of that function. Okay. In the equally spaced case, it looks nicer. If you set that up so that, it, that your previous node is minus h, this is zero, and that's plus h, then it turns out that one of the coefficients goes to zero. Uh, but once you've got that, you uh, integrate p of z over this thing on the left, and you wind up with the integral of p of z over z plus h squared plus integral of p of z over z plus h plus integral of p of z over z squared plus integral of p of z over z minus h plus integral of p of z over z minus h squared. So this gives us p one quarter p, uh, p prime of minus h, three quarters p of minus h, one quarter p prime of a part of one times p prime of zero, uh, three quarters p of h and p prime of h. And you look at that for a little bit and you say, aha, that's actually our compact finite difference formula. It relates the value of the derivative at minus h, 0, and h with the values of the functions at minus h and h. It doesn't need the function value at 0 because that residue in this particular case turned out to be 0. All right, how do I get the, the edge formulas? So the edge formulas, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to have z minus tau 0 squared, z minus tau 1 squared, z minus tau 2, and z minus tau 3. So that means we're going to pick up a function value at tau 2 and a function value at, at tau 3, but no derivative values there. We're only going to relate the value of the derivative at 0 and the derivative at 1. So we'll only have two equations or two unknowns in that equation. And in every other one in the interior, we have three. And if we do this again at the far end with the similar situation where it's going to be z minus tau n minus uh, three, z minus tau n minus two, and z minus tau n minus one squared, and z minus tau n squared, then we will have two uh, unknowns in that final equation. And it still maintains the tridiagonal shape of the system of equations. So that's important. So if we go ahead and do that, here's the resulting tridiagonal system that you get. And you can see that it looks rather like the uh, uh, ordinary Pade scheme for compact finite differences. And it looks rather like the comp the cubic spline equations, we've got these fours down the diagonal. But I draw your attention to the fact that the, uh, that the terms at the top and the bottom are different. So that uh, but it works. So I, what I've got here is uh, code, compact cubic, cubic spline, and uh, it's just reporting an error coefficient there. I, I, if I have time, I will go through that code uh, in some detail, but otherwise just take it as uh, uh, an authoritative statement that the fact that that number 22.09 is not gigantic is an indication that this code did its, did its job well. That's essentially the, the uh, constant coefficient in front of the power h to the power 4 for a random mesh, actually. Or maybe it was a chibi mesh on that one. Uh, we'll have to have to have a look. Okay, well, everybody knows that when you solve uh, linear systems of equations, that the condition number of the of the matrices really matter. So here's uh, 
dimension 46,368 matrices, and I took 10,000 matrices of these kinds, and I computed the condition numbers of all of those. And the condition numbers are fairly well distributed. The line in the middle is exactly at the dimension. So this is the dimension of the matrix, and this is saying most of the time the condition number of that tridiagonal matrix is less than n, less than the dimension. There's a few, when you choose the random uh, meshes, there's a few where the condition number gets quite large, up to n squared. And that can get, that can get bad, but look how few of them there are. So we expect that even for random meshes, where the meshes can have a really big mesh right next to a really tiny mesh, uh, tiny interval, we're still going to be okay. But that is, in fact, the bad case when you have giant jumps in sizes, a big uh, mesh, wide mesh right next to a narrow mesh, and maybe next to another wide one. So th that is the kind of thing that causes poor, in poor conditioning in this system. So think about not doing that. For the cubic spline case, you can make your matrices uh, symmetric, and they are symmetric in the equally, case, equally spaced case, and they're diagonally dominant. So that means they're positive definite. So a symmetric positive definite matrix is wonderful to work with numerically. It's just, it has a, a beautiful um, structured error bound, and we could, we could talk about that in a little bit. The compact finite differences on variable meshes are not immediately uh, expressed as as symmetric matrix. You can make them symmetric, but that requires uh, order and amount of more work. Okay, but in fact, we don't need to. So it turns out the matrices are what's called totally non-negative. So that means every minor, which is not zero, is actually positive. So this means all of the quantities that come up in the LU factoring, and that's without pivoting, are ratios of positive minors, so they're themselves positive. So we get this wonderful positive bidiagonal factoring of uh, this tridiagonal system. I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to prove that that uh, matrix is totally non-negative. From a theorem of Gantmacher and Krein, we need only show the leading principal minors are positive. Um, I got that theorem from the Handbook of Linear Algebra. So the Handbook of Linear Algebra, uh, edited by Leslie Hogben, is the next big reference that you should take away from here. That is a, a massive and massively useful book. And chapter 29, talks about uh, totally positive matrices and gives me the reference to Gantmacher and Krein. To help the analysis, you can factor out a, a diagonal matrix with positive entries. And so you do that just to make the algebra a little bit easier. So if we uh, look at our matrix, we see now, and it's uh, not symmetric, the, uh, the we have a 1 there, and h1 squared, h0 squared, h2 squared, h1 squared, h3 squared, etc. And then the bottom end is, is messed up. The slide has lost part of the that entry, but that entry will become important for us in a little bit. But you can see that apart from the first row and the last row, these things is, are diagonally dominant again. So that's going to help us. If we let uh, t, k, n plus 1 denote the leading principal submatrices. So now I'm considering a matrix of size n plus 1 by n plus 1. So that means my nodes are going from t0 up to tn. So there's n plus 1 uh, n plus 1 entries in the matrix and n subintervals in there. That's the uh, phrasing for, for now. So let uh, dk n plus 1 be the determinant of that upper block, the k by k upper block. By direct computation, you get d1, that's just that entry, that's easy, d2, so 2 by 2 determinant, d3, 
three by three determinant, crunch, 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 we get that. And I write this in a funny way. I write uh, D3N plus one as H1 squared times D2N plus one plus an obviously positive quantity. So this relates D3N plus one to the previous one. I do have to exclude one case. If I have only a four by four, if I have only the four by four case, so T0, T1, T, tau zero, tau one, tau two, and tau three, and I set up this system in this way, the determinant is gonna be zero, no matter what H's I get. And that's not gonna bother us because if I have four uh, data points, I can just fit a cubic to it, to all four pieces of data. I don't need to do anything fancy with splines. You use one, one cubic all the way across it. So I'm now gonna proceed under the assumption that the dimension of the matrix is greater than four. So we return to the proof and we take Laplace expansion about the last row of TK n plus one. So we have this tridiagonal matrix down and we're about the last row of that. Uh, and we give a, it gets, gets us a recursive formula for the determinant. It's quite easy to, to uh, do that. Um, determinants, it's, you know, pick off this one times the previous one and this one, and you have to do one more step to get, and you get this formula that relates DK to DK minus one and DK minus two. And we want to prove that all of these things are positive. So this is this being positive, that helps. So we like that, oh, we have a negative sign here. Minus HK minus three squared HK minus one squared times the determinant that was two levels back. And this is, this is true for all of the interior ones. This is not true for the final corner entry, which has got a different entry in that uh, last ent last element, the n plus one, n plus one element. And that n plus one, n plus one element is this uh, h thing here. But the n plus one determinant is related to n and n minus one, but with a different relationship than the interior ones are. For all interior leading minors, we may establish by induction that in fact, uh, dk minus one is a positive quantity times dk minus two plus a positive quantity. And once we establish that induction, then that proves that all the interior minors are, are positive because we proved directly that the first two were, actually the first one was, was uh, positive, that's enough. So we have, uh, we have to go from this equation to this equation. And it's actually pretty simple. We uh, expand out the HK minus two plus HK minus one squared. So we get HK minus one squared times DK minus one N plus one. And we use the recurrence uh, the inductive assumption that dk minus one n plus one is something times dk minus two plus a positive quantity. And the something times dk minus two is exactly what we need to cancel out the dk minus two here with the minus sign. And so we're left with positive, positive hk minus one squared times positive. And that's, that's done. That establishes by induction that all of our interior minors uh, for this tridiagonal matrix are positive. What about the last one? I don't have time to do it here. But if I was actually there, I would do it on the blackboard because the, the proof of those last, that you have to do some continued fraction manipulation and it's actually quite pretty. I, I quite like that. But because I'm not there, I made another video. So that other video is in my YouTube channel and I will make sure that you have copies of that. And so by that separate analysis, we prove that the final determinant is zero. And by the theorem of Gantt-Nocker and Krein, that establishes that the matrix is in fact totally non-negative. All the minors are either positive or zero. I'm very happy with that result and it apparently wasn't known. So that there's one thing. Great, totally non-negative. 
Why? Who cares? What, what good does it do? Well, for some more recent work on uh, totally positive matrices, you can see uh, Marco, Martinez, and Pena, uh, accurate bidiagonal decomposition of totally positive cauchy Vandermond matrices and applications. So that's in linear algebra and its applications. Uh, this arises from the work of, of Gasca at the University of Zaragoza, uh, who established some early results on the value of totally positive matrices. So that's a, a whole separate um, uh, area of research and it's quite active right now, it's quite interesting. For us, we're just tridiagonals, kind of the easiest possible case of a totally non-negative matrix. We managed to make that proof that, well, okay, great. What, what do we gain from knowing that this matrix is totally non-negative? So if you read theorem 9.12 of Nick Hyam's book, Accuracy and Stability for Numerical Algorithms, which is an absolutely wonderful book. Again, if you take nothing away except the references, take that away as a reference. That is a fabulous book. Uh, according to that theorem, a totally non-negative tridiagonal matrix can be solved using IEEE arithmetic with the unit Randolph mu by Gaussian elimination without pivoting with a backward error bounded by uh, the modulus of the change in the matrix is less than or equal to f of mu times the matrix. Now, there's not an error there. I didn't I didn't leave off the norm signs. That's the absolute value of a matrix means you take the absolute value of the matrix component wise. So each component in the delta A is going to be smaller than F of mu times each com the corresponding component in A. And I don't need absolute value signs on A because A is totally positive. So all of the entries of A are positive. And in particular, all of the entries of delta A are zero, where all of the entries of A are zero. So this delta A is another tridiagonal matrix. And more, the F of mu is just four times mu. Mu is the uh, unit round off, two to the minus 53 in double precision. And so this is two to the minus 51. So translating this component-wise error into forward error, this says that the the, com the component-wise error in the solution is less than f of mu times times the, the solution. This is astonishing accuracy. So the scale condition number for these particular uh, compact spline matrices, which is a structured condition number, which depends on the absolute value of A, uh, is actually about half the ordinary condition number. So I showed you that the ordinary condition number was, was quite well uh, distributed less than the dimension n, and the scale condition number is about half of that. So this means that your interior derivatives are going to be computed about as high as accuracy as you can possibly expect uh, in numerical analysis. That's really a, an astonishingly good work. Great! We now have established a theorem saying we've got totally positive pardon me, totally non-negative matrices, because there are some minors with which are zero. Totally non-negative matrices, so we have good numerical uh, stability and efficiency in computing the solution for the derivatives on the end. What do we do with those derivatives? Well, if you were on equally spaced points, what you've just done is you've computed all of the, just the right derivatives at the interior nodes to give twice continuously differentiable approximations. And the fact that we've chosen the derivatives at the edges to be fourth order accurate doesn't change that. So we found a slightly improved cubic spline in the, in the equally spaced case, which is very common. I actually like the fact that you use a tridiagonal matrix to specify the derivatives at the ends because I'm annoyed at having to choose between uh, the not a not conditions or various other, other schemes. You can do free splines or clamped splines or various other kinds. Of... The older scheme of Schwartz and Varga asked for third order accurate derivatives at the edges, and that seems to be very similar to what I'm trying to do. And I don't know why their idea didn't take, didn't, uh, uh, take off, but uh, here's something that I'm proposing. I have code for this, I made the code available 
in uh, on my GitHub site, so people can play with it if they like. Uh, so in conclusion, I want to say that that uh, Varga certainly knew a lot about totally non-negative matrices and probably still knows more than I ever will. So I doubt this result would surprise him. It's also true that the probability that this uh, compact cubic spline will take over from the not a not cubic spline is slight, but uh, I like it, and perhaps you will as well. However, in practice, I don't use this method. <laughs> in practice, I do something just a little bit different. Uh, instead of making it uh, choosing using four nodes to give my formula for the the left edge, um, I use five nodes, and I insist that the diagonal coefficient at the top is two plus root three, and that the next coefficient is one. I leave the other other one down at the other end. Uh, in a similar way, except that it turns out to be just absolutely straightforward. And I do this in the case of a uh, uniform mesh. And the reason I do that is if you've got a uh, uniform mesh, and so the matrix is two plus root three, one, one, four, one, one, four, one, one, four, one, one, four, one, four all the way down to the bottom where it's just uh, one, four, you can factor that matrix analytically. You just zip and you can know what the the L factor is and the U factor, and you don't even need to store anything. So you gain a, a, a factor. Uh, it's order N. It's always order N, but you gain a, a factor of uh, uh, order N in there. And you gain slightly on um, numerical stability because you're actually doing less arithmetic. You pay for that by slightly higher condition number, uh, but that doesn't seem to cause any problems. So the increase in speed is is actually noticeable, and and uh, um, worthwhile. My former student Ji Chao Zhao, who's now uh, uh, at the University of Auckland uh, doing cardiac simulation, he's been there for ten years now. <laughs> former student was it was a little while ago. Uh, we use this approach to solve financial option problems and cardiac simulation problems. I won't talk further about that uh, analytic technique, but it's, it's rather fun. So I would like to thank Eunice Chan for Python, Jupyter, and Markdown support. I gave the talk in uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook, and the work was supported in part by NSERC, and in part by a fellowship, uh, Xinara de los Rios at the University of Alcala. And I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm looking very much forward to the actual talk. Um, but this backup talk is, you know, well, internet being what it is. Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening. And thank you for your patience. <laughs>